and out. At Tehran, the big three made their plans for the destruction of the enemy's forces in Europe in the quickest possible time. Since then, a series of announcements have revealed the names of British and American leaders entrusted with high responsibility in the coming Second Front operations. General Eisenhower is to lead the combined British and American expeditionary forces organizing in the United Kingdom. In other words, he's to be the Supreme Second Front Commander-in-Chief. Deputy Supreme Commander is Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. At 53, he's the same age as Eisenhower, with whom he has long worked in close and brilliantly successful collaboration. General Sir Bernard Montgomery, leader of the 8th Army since August 1942, has won victories from Alamein to Tunis, from Tunis to Sicily and Italy. He'll command the British group of armies under Eisenhower. Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, whose experience in combined operations is second to none, witnessed Dunkirk and the Allied landings in North Africa, will command the Allied naval forces. His opposite number in the air is Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory, who has been Fighter Command Chief since November 1942. And General Spatz, who has been leading the North African Air Forces in the Mediterranean, is to command the American Strategic Bombing Force operating against Germany. Meanwhile, what of the Mediterranean Front? General Sir Henry Maitland Wilson is the new Commander-in-Chief in this theatre. Lieutenant General Devers has been appointed to command the American forces in the Mediterranean. He will also serve as Deputy CNC to General Wilson. To command the Allied armies in Italy, General Sir Harold Alexander. One of the two last men to leave the beaches at Dunkirk, he was one of the first to return to the continent and is now battling forward on the road to Rome. All these dramatic announcements concern leaders well tried and tested in successful operations during months of almost unbroken victories. The men they lead know and trust them. And like their commanders, the men of all three services have gained vast experience and supreme confidence in readiness for the opening of the real second front. The very familiarity of these pictures of past operations tells its own story of knowledge gained and lessons learnt. They have trained for the second front in the hardest school of all, the school of actual combat. the leaders think of the men under their command? Well, that's really a superfluous question, for they know they will be leading the finest material in the world. Men of all the services of the British Empire, who side by side with their allies, have been training and fighting for this very opportunity, the grand assault on Europe. They have withstood the years of defeat, they have triumphed over unpreparedness and lack of equipment, and now they are ready to deliver the blow that will wipe out Hitler and the Nazis and all their treacherous associates. Only one word of warning. Let no one think it will be a walkover. The fighting men know it will be the most terrific struggle of the whole war. The home front, too, must steel itself against just that. This 